So closest to me, Hugh Siegel, the fifth master of Massey College, was an associate cabinet secretary in Ontario in the late 1970s and early 1980s, a chief of staff to the prime minister in the 1990s, and in June 2014, he finished a, a nine-year term as a senator representing Ontario. And his work in the Senate included being vice chair of the subcommittee on poverty of the Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology, which issued the report In From the Margins, a detailed study of urban poverty in Canada. And he has stated, my primary concern is the steady reduction of poverty. Welcome, Mr. Siegel. On the far side from me, the Reverend Michael Alton, the 12th Bishop of Ontario, who has served parishes in Albert and O'Leary, Prince Edward Island, St. Peter's Collins Bay, and Christchurch, Belleville. Prior to entering the priesthood, Bishop Alton was a practicing member of the bars of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and he served as a member of the municipal council in his hometown of Port Elgin, New Brunswick. And Bishop Alton cites a passion for the church's engagement with the world in the mission, quoting theologian Thomas Buchner, who wrote that our vocation as disciples of Jesus Christ is found where your greatest passion meets the world's greatest need. Welcome, Bishop Alton. And in the center, moderating and keeping the two of them apart, Eric Friesen, was born and raised in Altona, Manitoba, in a Mennonite community, and as many of us who have heard him speak know, that has influenced him greatly. He has worked with several radio stations in Canada and the United States, and has done extensive volunteering work in the arts sector. He presently co-hosts a book club at Collins Bay Penitentiary. And we should congratulate you. At the end of the month, you will be awarded an honorary doctorate of laws at Brandon University. So congratulations. <laughs> and thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you very much. Peter, before you leave, we want the mic. <laughs> we've, uh, we've, we were to have uh, lapel mics, but uh, for some reason they're not working. Every time Michael and I do something with a microphone, we have there's some gremlin in the works, but we will make it happen. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to have you all here. Uh, it's an honor to be here with, uh, with Hugh Siegel and with uh, Bishop Michael Olden. I want to congratulate Peter Gower for his tenacious ability to get us all three here at one date, <laughs> to actually find a date that we could all be here, and also to congratulate uh, Peter for his great work here as co-chair of Lunch by George a program that occurs here in this very space. And Peter, of course, being the inclusive and welcoming man that he is, has asked many others who are involved in addressing poverty and homelessness in this community to display uh, literature and uh, are here around the room. So I hope that if you haven't had a chance to look at it, you will get a chance to do so later. So here are the rules that we've set down for this evening. We will probably uh, discuss amongst the three of us for about an hour or so, and then we will open it up to questions from the floor. We will return this microphone to that stand over there, and so you'll be able to come up uh, to the microphone and ask questions as well, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions I won't ask that you will want to ask, so you will get a chance to, to do that. So this evening we're going to focus on the issue of poverty and homelessness. We all live in a wealthy country. This country by any standard is a wealthy country. We live in a prosperous community of Kingston and, and area, and yet we have not only poverty and homelessness in this community, but from all those whom I know who are involved in it, it's been getting worse, not better. Uh, Canadians live in poverty right across this country, depending on which uh, website you gain access to, between 1 in 7 or a 1 in 11 Canadians live in some form of poverty, 4 to 5 million Canadians. 
And of course, there are many subgroups of poverty. There are homeless people, there are single moms and their children, there are people with disabilities, First Nations communities, and a lot of prisons which are filled with men and women who overwhelmingly come from poor and dysfunctional families. Poverty affects us all and is all of our problem. So I'm going to begin, uh, I think I'll start with uh, Hugh Siegel. I'd like, us, I'd like each of you to outline the problem as you see it. Uh, Peter Gower quoted you, uh, Hugh, as saying, my primary concern is the steady reduction of poverty. So how are we doing since you said that? The answer is we could be doing substantially better and that the biggest enemy that those who are wanting to do something constructive about poverty faces is any sense of self-satisfaction. Number two, one of the difficulties we have on the issue is that too many Canadians don't see poverty as something that's important to get their The vast majority of Canadians have jobs. The vast majority of Canadians are not poor. Hence, it's not an issue and they're not. And I think there's been a failure of the political class, all political parties, federal and provincial, over the years, to connect the real costs of poverty to other critical issues of importance to all of us in our day-to-day -day lives. For example, you often hear from opponents of change or proponents of the status quo. But you know, they used to say to me when we would have this debate in Ottawa, you know, Senator, poverty is very complex. There's no simple solution. Don't look for simple solutions. And you know, it could be because of family breakup. It could be because of language problems. It could be because of other difficulties. To which my response was, well, if we view it as complex, then there's never a solution. Why don't we try the one solution we know how to do, because we did it for our senior citizens in Ontario in 1975, then it spread across the country, and then became a national policy, which is to top people up automatically if their income falls beneath a certain level. It's not an answer to all problems, but it's amazing how problems become more manageable when our fellow human beings can afford to eat and pay rent and live in a warm place and have clothes and make some use of public transportation as they go about their lives. And I think the failure has been to say, you know what, if you care about health care, and if you believe that the quality of health care is important, and if you believe that Tommy Douglas and John Diefenbaker and Mike Pearson were right in the 60s to bring in national health care insurance in this country, which, by the way, wasn't revenue neutral. You had to invest at the outset to make it happen. Then you have to worry about pressures faced by the health care system because poverty produces a pipeline full of people who get sick sooner, go to the emergency ward faster, stay in hospital longer, and in the context of generally difficult lives, die sooner. And I don't recall the meeting where Canadians decided that part of our social policy premise is that poor people get to die sooner. That's just part of the deal. I forget, I don't think there ever was a meeting that raised that. But that's what complacency produces. So the challenge for those of us who think we can genuinely do better is not to view poverty as an isolated issue which only involves, I'll say, my number, Eric, we may disagree on this, 10 to 12 percent of the population in our cities, 15 to 20 percent of the population in rural Ontario, and way more amongst our First, our First Nations brothers and sisters, not to mention the fact that there is a guaranteed annual income for, for guests of Her Majesty, which is how we refer to prisons in Kingston, guests of Her Majesty in our penal institutions at a cost of between seventy dollars to $140,000 a year each, based on the level of security that's required, when we know that had we intervened earlier in people's lives on the poverty front to give them a shot and give them a break, they would not have had to end up as guests of Her Majesty, or prematurely ill, or dying too young, or with a series of pathologies and illnesses which are brought on by poverty. So the failure of those of us to date to connect that reality with the larger cost issues in our society, 
as well as the humanitarian commitment we need to have to all of our brothers and sisters to give everybody a fair shot is one of the reasons we haven't made the progress we need. The other relates to a civil service mentality, and I say that having been one, highest of regard for our public servants and the great work they do, but in every department of finance, in every government in the world, regardless of whether it is left or right or center or liberal or conservative or social democrat, they all have the same view. Our job is to preserve the fiscal spending discretion of our minister and of our government. So any program that automatically passes funds out to people who are eligible without the minister getting to make a decision name by name and person by person diminishes their discretion, therefore we're not doing a good job, therefore we're going to be less important, therefore it's going to affect our job. And I think it was, I think it was Sophocles who said that the first job of a bureaucrat is to protect their own job. So the challenge we face is to break out of that mix and make it perfectly clear that if Canada ranks in the top five worldwide, in terms of the management of poverty among seniors. Our seniors are in the top five worldwide for how they do. Why are we down in the mid-20s in our rank for people who are working age but happen to be poor? Why is Slovenia and the Czech Republic doing way better than us? What could that possibly be about? I think it's about lack of imagination, lack of political courage, and too many interests in our society that are very happy with the status quo standing in the way with genuine progress. Now, I say that, I won't be pessimistic in the presence of his grace, because I think there are reasons for optimism. Premier of PEI, the mayor of Calgary, the mayor of Edmonton, the city council of this great and historic town we call home, and other city councils. The Canadian Medical Association, not a gathering of Marxists, last thing I checked. <laughs> have all passed resolutions in favor of a guaranteed annual income. And to her credit, the premier of this province insisted that there be a commitment in the last throne speech to, and budget, to a real pilot project for a guaranteed basic income here in Ontario, which they are in the process of working on and designing now. So are we at the, at the end of the battle? We're at the end of the beginning, as Mr. Churchill would say, but it is moving in the right direction, and we have to keep on pushing to make sure that it does, so that we'll be able to say, we were part of the multi-generational group that helped Canadians come to the same conclusion they did in the 1960s about healthcare. People said to Tommy Douglas, put it out of your mind. It's never gonna happen. We can't afford it. The doctors will go on strike. Well, here we are, and our cost of delivering one of the finest healthcare systems in the world, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good, all things considered. It's one of the most efficient anywhere, and we get far more value for money than our American friends, and on every front, longevity, quality of life, and all those indices, we are doing better because they had the courage in the 60s to do what had to be done. We now have to, at the turn of the century, show the same courage on the issue of poverty, which I think is the last social policy frontier, the one we have to embrace, so they can say about all of us and our friends and colleagues across the country that they're the ones who broke the back of this thing. And I just want to do a shout out to the, um, to the Kingston Action Group for a Basic Income Guarantee, who've now done a charter it's an outstanding document. It's on their website. I urge you to get a look at it. You put that together with the motion at City Council, what's happening at the provincial level, there is real grounds for optimism. Not complacency, not thinking this problem is going to be solved, but real grounds for activist engagement to take it to the next step so we see implementation in the genuine future. Thank you very much, Hugh. So, uh, Michael Olton, I'll pass the uh, microphone to you. Your thoughts from a Christian's and a clergyman's perspective. 
Thank you very much, Eric. And it's wonderful to be here this evening. I have been looking forward to this evening for weeks and weeks and weeks. A few times I haven't looked forward to it because somebody told me that you were coming here tonight to debate Hugh Siegel, and I suddenly felt like a sparring partner. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I've been looking forward to this because I know the heart and soul that uh, Hugh has for this particular topic, and I know the heart and soul that so many people have in the city of Kingston addressing issues related to poverty, homelessness, issues that are challenging not only our community here in Kingston, but communities right across Ontario and Canada. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity to address that now. Um, the Whig article that was uh, published regarding this evening's session, Peter Gower said something that I think is critically important, that uh, the Lunch by George program here, that he is looking forward to the day when it's no longer necessary. He's looking forward to the day when he kind of works himself out of this wonderful volunteer opportunity. And you know what? I think we're all looking forward to the day when these particular institutions, and I'm looking through the many of them within our city of Kingston that are available for people to access, I don't think any of the people who are part of that are looking forward to the long-term perspective to, for those programs. And I think it's one of the few institutions within our society that when they finally cease forever, there will be absolutely no nostalgia looking back on it. I think perhaps more a sense of satisfaction about the job that was accomplished in charting a course for the future laying before us. So that's the, that's the first thing that I think is so important and, and the, the thanks and appreciation that we must show for the people who are engaged in this work through our, throughout our city doing amazing things. I think we have a tremendous opportunity. There is a, a, a statement in, in scripture, and I think Eric, we were, we've been chatting about this earlier, uh, there's a phrase that sometimes gets tossed around in these debates, and, and in some ways, Hugh, you may have referred to it when your colleagues were saying to you, you know, this is a complex problem. It's multi-layered. Uh, you know, it's something we'll always have to grapple with. In the, in the church setting, uh, sometimes you'll get quoted to you the passage of Scripture, you know, it says, the poor you will always have with you. And that can be a very difficult passage to deal with. You know, the context of the passage in the Gospels is where uh, Jesus is at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and this very expensive perfume is uh, poured over his feet. And uh, I, I sometimes am troubled by how that goes because it's Judas Iscariot who says, why wasn't that sold and the money given to the poor? Now, aside from the fact that the parentheses in the passage say he only said that because he was a thief and he liked to steal from the common, that aside, I get troubled because well, he actually made a good point. And I don't want to be on the side with Judas Iscariot making, making a good point. But the thing is, what's true about it is he's missed the point of what that's all about. Because he was approaching it from an either-or situation. And I think we need to approach these situations from a both-and situation. So I take that passage and I go back to its roots in the Hebrew Scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 15 where it says, and sometimes uh, you have to remember when Jesus is quoting these scriptures, uh, he, is, he, is, he is putting out a sentence that everybody knows the whole story. It's like if, if you were talking to somebody and said, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question. And you know it's all about procrastination and Hamlet, and we know the whole story. When Jesus said that, it's the same thing. Everybody's mind would go back to their scriptures in Deuteronomy, where it says, the poor you will always have with you, therefore do not neglect to open your hand to them at all times. It is a positive direction given to everybody to make sure that they care for every member of society. Uh, we say that sometimes in the modern context, that nobody is left behind. And so I believe that's what we are called to do as people of faith. But I also believe that we have a tremendous opportunity, and, and Hugh has referenced that as well. Uh, we have an opportunity to, because I'm a firm believer in the development of strong community partnerships to tackle these insoluble problems. And what I say to leaders who sometimes say that, you know, this, it, you know, leadership is a tremendous privilege. When you're given the opportunity to lead in any organization, the first thing that comes up in my mind is that you have been given a tremendous privilege. And as leaders, sometimes we are always surrounded by amazing, dedicated people who are working with us. But sometimes when they say to you that these problems are insoluble, I sometimes say back to, the, to those leaders, don't worry, if it was easy to do, they wouldn't have asked you to do it. 
And so I think it's important for us to understand that yes, the problem is difficult, but we have a tremendous opportunity uh, before us. And I want to outline just a few of the things that I see. A number of years ago, I attended a stewardship conference in the United States in Seattle, Washington. And it was one of these things the Episcopalian Church put on, and because the Episcopalians have tons of money with all kinds of opportunities to do things, their conferences tend to be first rate. They bring in the best people, and, and their, their conferences are well worth attending and hearing the people who are speaking there. And when I went to this conference in Seattle, Washington, one of the events that I went to was one of these demographic analysis. You have ever been to one of those where they talk about the millennials and the baby booners and the X generation and all of that sort of thing? And I was listening to their, to their description of the, of the people that we're grappling with and the people who are in leadership within the life of our church. But there was something said at that time, and that would have been about 2004, maybe 2005. The people who were there, who are expert in their field across the United States, said there's something we're noticing in the generation that's coming up. And we're talking about the generation that at that time were about age 9, 10, 11, that age group. We're noticing something so common amongst those young people that we're now putting a name to that generation. And we're calling them the we generation. Because the common theme from these young people is there has to be more in life than just what I can get out of it. And I, I, the question I asked at that time was, what do you suppose is, is the reason for that? And my thinking was that these were young people who had experienced the horror of 9-11. They were two or three years removed from that. They grappled with the response to that, what was happening to the world, and, and the difficulties of the world suddenly came very close to home for them. And I think that was beginning to churn inside of them, and, and they were beginning to say, you know, I need to make a change. But this was before Craig Kielberger and the Me to We movement. It's amazing how we see these movements, these young people who have taken leadership in the life, not only of our communities, but in the life of our world. And what a wonderful opportunity that is. I look at the makeup of the House of Commons now. I went to question period a few weeks ago. I'm kind of nerdy that way. We went up to Ottawa and I thought, what am I going to do? I'm in Ottawa. I'm going to question period. So I went over to watch the new government in action. And, and I looked at the age makeup of the MPs. And I don't know, I'm only 56, I'm not that old, but they looked like, you know, it was kind of college, you know, it, it, it looked, not that they were behaving that way, but it was that, it looked like these young people, but when they were standing up, they had such command of, of what they were speaking about. They were speaking with such passion. That's that demographic. That demographic that's now moving into their mid-twenties, and they are taking leadership. There's a, another fellow with interesting hair south of the border who is running for high office. <laughs> and he seems to have somehow captured that demographic. I, I was amazed. I had never heard of Senator Bernie Sanders before at all, the independent senator from Vermont. He's been around for a long time. I first heard about Bernie Sanders when my son came home from university and said, Dad, you've got to listen to this guy. And he introduced Bernie Sanders to me. And then my daughter came home one weekend from Carleton University, walked through the door and said to me, Dad, are you feeling the burn? And I thought, what is this all about? And I started following what he was doing. And, and people are saying, and, and you know, sometimes we say in the world of the church, you know, our demographic is fairly elderly. We have a high average age. Bernie Sanders, if he were to be a two-term president of the United States, would be well in his 80s by the time he finished, there is a message that is resonating. In New York City, in Washington Square Park, before the New York primary, Bernie Sanders attracted a crowd of 28,000 people who came to hear him. And that demographic, that age group, was that particular group of people. They are impassioned when they hear his message. And I think we make a mistake if we write off both Bernie Sanders as, you know, he's only a make-the-rich-pay kind of guy. If we write off his message, or if we write off the passion of these young people by saying, oh, basically, they only want to get something for nothing. They're just in it for the free tuition. I think we make a huge mistake when we do that. There is something happening in our North American continent, and I believe that translates also to Canada. That's the first part of it. The other part of it is I'm a firm believer 
that m many amazing things can happen when people of goodwill come together and form partnerships. There's a saying that I like to, uh, I like to employ with that, that you find higher ground by first seeking common ground. I'm a strong proponent of the ecumenical movement. I'm a member of the Canadian Council of Churches who will be meeting in Ottawa over the next three days, and the opportunity for us to come together and to say, yes, if we want to sit down, we can find many things that divide us. But what are the things that draw us together? What are the things that we are able to do together? And I believe that's true not only for the churches and the ecumenical movement, I believe that's also true for the agencies, the governmental agencies and the non-governmental agencies within our society. There's an opportunity for us to come together and to start. I believe this, and when you talk about this as, as, the, as the last major battle that we have, I, I think also I'd say it's almost a nation-building exercise that we are doing here. I think this is particular to who we are as Canadians and we have an opportunity to come together to do that. So we have a number of allies in this field uh, that can come together and make a huge difference. Hugh, you referenced the fact that the government in its, in its recent budget has designated Kingston for a pilot project for basic income guarantee. That's, I, think, I think I read that right. I don't think they've quite made that decision yet. Kingston has done a resolution at City Council on the issue, uh, but I don't think the province has quite designated how they're going to go at that, but I'm glad to talk about that in a moment. Okay, that would be, be wonderful. I think we're ideally placed, and, I, and I'll say why, because I think Eastern Ontario, and Kingston in particular, and people ask me to describe, I'm saying this over the last few weeks in the churches, and people, I go away to conferences and people say, would you describe your diocese, the area that I serve? And the Diocese of Ontario in the Anglican world takes in everything from Trenton all the way to Cardinal, up to Kentville and all the way over to Bancroft in that area. So I was at a, at a meeting once and they said, describe it in one word. And I said, that's easy. It, and it's amazing how fast that word came to me, it's relational. We value our relationships. Every time we get together, we value those connections. We have, we have three cities in our area, but they really function like towns because of, of those relationships we share. Now, that can be good and that can be difficult. Sometimes there's a saying back home where I'm from, you can get a little too much in one another's wool, and that happens sometimes. But, but, but really, we have this wonderful opportunity to come together. It's a natural thing for us to do. So I think to build these partnerships to tap into this generation that's coming along and saying, you know, we want to make a difference. And then if, if we do have the privilege of being a pilot project for a basic income guarantee initiative, then if we want to get the best bang for our big bucks, I think we need to convene a summit of, of leaders, political leaders, community leaders, nonprofit leaders, faith group leaders, to come together and to say, what is it that we want to do together? Because when we come together, amazing things can happen. And I think, uh, you know, the, the energy in this room, the fact that so many of you came out tonight uh, to, uh, around this issue, I don't think anyone here in this room feels that this is insoluble. There is a solution. And together we can, we can come together and find it. And last but not least, I want it because Hugh is bashful, and he would never put a plug in for this. I'm going to put a plug in for this. I bought Hugh's book, which is The Two Freedoms. I've heard him speak about these freedoms before. I've read speeches that he's given uh, related to these two freedoms. And this book relates uh, primarily to Canadian foreign policy. But Hugh circles back often in the book to talk about our domestic relationships. And what, what caused my heart to soar in reading the book is that you speak about the importance of values and that the decisions that we take within our society, we first articulate what are the values that drive our society. From my perspective, when I'm dealing with people within with my Anglican context, I speak about that in terms of the values we do from, from our biblical narrative, from our story, from our history, and then we join that story with the story of others, and we can make amazing things happen. So thank you for the opportunity to be here with you this evening and to share in this exciting initiative. Thank you very much, Michael. Well, Hugh, why don't you follow up on this? Uh, uh, what's it called, a guaranteed uh, income? I mean, you seem to... It, it's not a done deal, but it's... Well, I'll tell you a story, and if you ever find yourself reading the memoirs of uh, Darcy McHugh, which just came out. So Darcy McHugh was uh, Mr. Davis's Minister of Finance, 
one of the most conservative finance ministers in Ontario's history. I think he wore a pinstripe suit to bed, I'm not sure. Uh, he wore his uh, Bank of Montreal tie, his Toronto Club cufflinks. He was very much, they called him the Duke of uh, Chatham-Kent, and he was very much of the old school of John Parmenter Robarts politics. But he was one of those who brought in the Garrington Annual Income Supplement for our senior citizens in this province. Let me tell you how that happened. It's a very interesting dynamic. Mr. Davis got elected with a minority government in 1975, which meant the Liberals and the New Democrats together had more seats than he did. And at one of the committee hearings on uh, estimates and whatever, the NDP and the Liberals moved a motion to reduce the minister's community and social services salary to a dollar. Normally, the thing you do for symbolic purposes is to reduce it by a dollar. They wanted to reduce Margaret Birch's salary to a dollar and her deputy minister's salary to a dollar. Why? Because, in their view, the entire issue of seniors' poverty was being ignored by that government. That was their position. The Toronto Star had been doing a series of stories about seniors, mostly women, because at that point in our healthcare and demographic cycle, women lived longer than men by a long shot. Most of the men had died at a younger age, and the vast majority of men died without pensions or savings or a house that had built up some equity that one could use to retire on. And um, the stories about women buying a little bit of dog food, a little bit of cat food to add to their protein were not apocryphal, and they were not made up, they were real. That's how people were trying to manage on not enough money. The NDP, you'll remember Stephen Lewis, pretty articulate, hardworking guy, Bob Nixon of the, of the Liberals, were pushing hard on this issue. I am 25 years of age. Of course, when you're 25 years of age, you know everything. And I was Mr. Davis's legislative secretary. And I was sitting in my office, minding my own business, when Douglas Wright, the deputy minister, comes into my office, and Douglas was an engineer by training. He went on to head the Council on University Affairs, be president of the University of Waterloo, a very distinguished, hardworking public servant. He came around the corner and said, they just voted in that committee to reduce my salary to a dollar. What are you going to do about it to me? Right? 25. I'm 25 years old. That's right, Eric. So I said, well, Mr. Deputy, let me assure you of two things. One, we're not going to have an election to save your salary. There are many reasons to have an election. That would not be one of them. Secondly, it's not the law until the committee report is accepted by the legislature as a whole. So why don't we try to find out what it is they really care about, because they don't care a darn about your salary or the minister's salary, they're trying to make a point. When it became apparent what the point was, three weeks later, not three months, not three years, W. Darcy McHugh, Duke of Kent, MPP for Chatham, stood up in his place and announced the guaranteed annual income supplement for seniors. Why? Because they fought the war, they fought the depression, they built Ontario, and no senior citizen should, not, should, should, be, should be forced to live in poverty, number one. And number two, if we make it automatic, make it automatic through the tax system, you file your taxes, we're all supposed to file our taxes every year. If you fall beneath a certain level, you get topped up. And he'd already been on the phone to the federal minister of finance to make sure the tax forms would be changed, because as Ontarians, we file one tax form, and there's a piece that goes to Ontario and a piece that goes to Ottawa. The level of poverty for seniors in Ontario, when he stood up to speak, mostly women, as I mentioned, 34%. 34% of the people above the age of 65 were living beneath the poverty line. Three years after the introduction of that automatic top-up, that number fell to 3%. So when people say to me, you can't afford this, You've never done it before. It doesn't work. My answer is, actually, we have done it before. It is affordable, and it will work. And our challenge now is to make that case in a more constructive and broad-minded way so that we sweep in, hopefully, the entire country. And look, if Saskatchewan and Alberta, if PEI and Ontario head down a road in this direction, Quebec is already their new, their new liberal premier, some who was elected a few years ago, made a direct public admonition to their minister of what they call social solidarity in Quebec, 
to bring in a guaranteed annual income and to eradicate poverty in Quebec. So you now have this as a major direction from the major political authorities, left, right, and center. So I'm kind of optimistic. And remember, those of you who are students of Canadian history will know that the first party to suggest a guaranteed annual income was the social credit party of Bible Bill Eberhardt in Alberta. Because a lot of what drove them in the 30s was a view that the powerful banks and institutions in central Canada were ripping off the average farmer and working people and we had to stand in their way. I don't agree with all of their analysis at the time, but they reflected a strong public mood that fair is fair and decency has to be addressed. Now, I happen to think that business can be an ally here and they are not opponents. I think of leaders in the financial community, leaders in business who have spoken out about us not doing enough with respect to poverty, not doing enough with respect to a fair break for all Canadians. Some of you may remember another Kingstonian by the name of George Thompson, alive and well, lives on Wolf Island. I think he's the chairman or the incoming chairman of the hospital, KGH. He was given a job of taking a look at how we should reform many, many years ago when Mr. Peterson was premier and John Sweeney was the minister of Comsoc. He was a liberal minister, he was a Roman Catholic, I think he had eight or nine children, he was an active, engaged father. And he was asked to do this review of how welfare was working. And he came out with a series of findings and recommendations. The numbers were too low. Making people line up at the welfare office was demeaning and unnecessary. We have the technology, this is back in the 80s, to actually put the money directly in their account every month, treating them like human beings, like everybody else and a list of other changes. He brought in the proposition that some people need particular dietary support because of the nature of their disease and their, um, and their nutritional capacity. When he made that announcement of the findings, he was surrounded by every major business person in Bay Street, from the insurance companies and the banks and the resource companies, because they understood that a broadening economic mainstream where everybody gets a chance to participate is the kind of healthy economy where people can make legitimate profits for good and substantial reason in a fair-minded way. When you exclude an entire slice of the population, you are creating difficulties in society which are going to be very expensive and very problematic. It may strike all of us in this room as odd for me to say that we are on the cusp of labor shortages in this country. We, we know that unemployment is too high. We all know people who are looking for work. But the truth of the matter is that in terms of the skilled base that we need to run a modern economy, we are not producing the amount of people we need with the right skills to do it properly. We can't afford to say to 10% of our population, you're poor, you don't have the skills, you're not going to participate. Okay, we'll bring in foreign workers to solve that problem. That is no way for Canada to get ahead. We have to give more and more people the chance to improve their own lives and become part of the system. One final anecdotal story. I know a woman, she's now a very distinguished and elegant grandmother, but she was a single mother in Ottawa, uh, two kids. She had a university degree, there had been a divorce, and she was in one of those circumstances she was trapped in the welfare cycle. What I say about welfare in Ontario is that it's a social safety net strong enough to entangle, not strong enough to support. And her problem was, she's a very bright woman, she understood that if she went for a graduate degree at Carleton, her ability to earn a living and do better and have more resources for her kids and help would be enhanced. But in those days, the rules in the welfare system were very simple. If you applied for OSAP, for financial assistance to go to school, they dropped you off welfare instantaneously. She needed that welfare because she had children getting free dentistry, she was getting housing assistance and all the other pieces. But she was an honest woman. And she went down to talk to the welfare office, the Ontario Works Office as it was called, and um, described her circumstance and her conundrum. And the welfare officer, a gentleman, leaned forward and said, hey, I can't hear you. How long is that graduate degree going to be? It's about a year. Call me in a year, we'll see how it's going. In other words, he was going to look the other way so she could actually get her graduate degree. She got her graduate degree within two years. 
every penny she had ever received from Ontario Works had been paid back and then some because she was earning more money, she had a higher degree, and she was doing well. And she ended up becoming one of the great activists on this file in Ottawa and on a national basis as we speak. That's what our existing welfare system does to frustrate progress. It's not anybody's intent, but the way it operates is a little bit inhumane, dem demeaning. One of the people who appeared before us, Your Grace, when we were in Halifax, Senator Eggleton, myself, and the committee, was a wonderful woman who volunteered in her local church for a very long time. She described a meeting that took place in September as the Christmas basket crowd was meeting to gather and make their plans. How many baskets do we need? What are we going to put in the baskets? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. How was going to, who's going to get the toys? Who's going to get the Christmas cake? All of that good stuff. One member of the congregation, uh, who was from overseas, but someone who's a good standing member in good standing, said, "You know, the nature of our parish changed a little bit." They're not all Christians. Some of them are from the Islamic community. Some of them are from overseas. Some of them don't observe Christmas the same way we do. Some observe a different Christmas because they're Orthodox, etc. Why don't we just give them the money and let them make their own decision about how they want to celebrate this time of year? Well, these wonderful, hardworking, committed, Christian, absolutely spiritual, and community-minded women were horrified that the Christmas basket program would come to an end. And it wasn't because they were insensitive or less than kind or caring. It's because, well, the way we've always done it is we decide what the ne'er-do-wells need. We do it with the largest of hearts and the warmest of feelings and the deepest of empathy. But it's our decision. And that goes back to the Victorian roots of anti-poverty programs where the swells decided what the, the, the people who were doing less well needed. And that, if you think about how Ontario Works operates now, despite, by the way, fine public servants who work very hard to be as kind and humane as the system will allow, there are over 900 different rules around eligibility for Ontario Works as we sit here in this church hall this evening. You can be the finest public servant in the world. How do you administer 900 rules and nuances? How do you men then make judgments about how people live their lives because they're poor? There is not one iota of social data that says wealthy people will spend money more wisely than low-income people. <laughs> None whatsoever. In fact, if you think about it, a low-income person doesn't have many, they're not planning that trip to, to Florida. They're not planning to do a wine tour of Niagara. They're planning on how to get enough food in the fridge, pay the rent, have warm clothes for the kids in winter, and maybe be able to use public transportation. All the money gets recirculated back in the economy. That's the most efficient use of money. And then when people say to me, you know, they used to say, Senator, you know what happens. You pay people to do nothing, and they will do nothing. They won't show up to work. Well, the only test we ever did in Canada was called MinCom, and you should Google it. It was in Dauphin, Manitoba. In 1975, Prime Minister Trudeau, the pair, and uh, Ed Schreier did this pilot project for five years, where they tested exactly how this kind of automatic top-up would work. 17% of the community of Dauphin needed a bit of help. Everybody signed up, filed your taxes, etc. But what they found out was that the whole community benefited because, and this was only found out many, it was a typical Canadian event. They invest, they have a program, it goes on, the government's changed both at Manitoba and in Ottawa, and that's the end of it. No one even spends the time to figure out whether the money was well spent. Well, a young academic by the name of Dr. Evelyn Forget from the University of Manitoba Health Science Centre began five or six years ago to say, you know what, Canadians have the right to know how this worked. How much was spent? What were the benefits? What were the costs? Because if we're ever going to do this again, we should see what the evidence tells us. Thank God we now have our census back. We're back in the mindset of where we need evidence to make decisions, which is a good thing. 
And um, what she found was as follows. Labor force participation did not diminish during the period of time when 17% were being topped up. Some things did diminish, because she had 1,800 boxes of anonymized healthcare records from the Manitoba Health Science faculty and from Manitoba Public Insurance. Admissions to hospital during the period of the test went down by eight or nine percent. Police arrests went down. Car accidents went down. All the things that relate to a measure of stress and a measure of anxiety about making things balance at the end of the month began to diminish. Do you know what an eight or nine percent annual reduction in healthcare expenditures in, in Ontario or in Canada would do in terms of savings in the billions? There is a reason that when the police appeared before our Senate committee, they said, quite frankly, on the issue of poverty and crime, we don't believe that poor people are any more disposed to crime than anybody else, but we don't spend our time in the best parts of town. We get called to deal with problems in the difficult parts of town. And our system is taken up with people who begin in poverty, get tied up with all the things we know poverty is a precise predictor of, precise predictor of bad healthcare outcomes, precise predictor of substance abuse, precise predictor of family violence, precise predictor of bad economic and, and, um, and employment outcomes, precise predictor of early dropouts of school. They only found two groups of the people of Dauphin, Manitoba, who didn't show up to work as much. Referred to by statistics counted at the time as unattached young males. Euphemism, high school students, right? Why did they not show up to work? Because that extra little bit of money meant they could stay in school till they finished high school. And we all know in this room and across the country how much more important it is to finish high school especially back in the 1970s. And before mat leave, before maternity leave, a lot of mothers of very young children, infants, used this top up to stay home a little longer with their kids before they went back to work. And we know that there are huge benefits associated with that particular choice when people choose to make that choice on their own. So what I hope a pilot project will do at some level is to test all of these theses in today's economy. 1975 was 40 years ago. So things have changed. The nature of the economy has changed. The nature of our cost base, the fiscal system, have all changed. So we should test it out in a modern way. But the good news is we do not have to wait until a two or three year test is finished before we start to make changes. Because in today's technology, in terms of research, in terms of understanding trends, we are able to do a saturation test. His grace referred to a test in Kingston. Whatever community is chosen, you can do a saturation test, one community like Dauphin, but you can also do a series of other tests, disparate groups across the province at the same time. Our First Nations brothers and sisters, people who are working in, in certain parts of Ontario that have specific economic difficulties, all that data can roll in. And if you go home tonight and go to, your, go to your computers and check on the Finnish experiment in a guaranteed annual income, which is alive and well and launching, they're communicating everything about design and everything about what they're trying to achieve every day to the public. It's not going to be kept secret for many years. It's going to be rolling out on a regular basis. So we can know as taxpayers in Canada, in Ontario, how the test, once it's launched, is going what results it's producing for different approaches, both in particular communities and on a broader basis, so that we can push our governments to act. The 2011 general federal election, when I was still an active conservative, um, a little less active now. I'm inactive now. I'm an inactive conservative now. Um, uh, that TV debate, poverty didn't come up. The national TV debate between our party leaders, the word poverty wasn't mentioned. And I remember calling Steve Pakin, because he was the moderator of the show, and he was a wonderful guy, and I said, Steve, like, what's that about? He says, well, you know, the networks do polling first to see what people want to discuss, and not a lot of people said they wanted to discuss poverty. I said, Steve, 
You know that a poor family that's trying to live hand to mouth maybe doesn't have time to answer polls? Maybe they're not thinking about politics first and foremost, they're thinking about it's going to be cold, do we have money for heat this month? What kind of business is this? So they did actually raise it a little bit. But none of the national parties, except for our friends in the Green Party, to their credit, had an actual platform position on a guaranteed annual income. And the Green Party's been there for a long time. I think we have to build a pressure, a pressure point so no political party can offer candidates across this country without having an explicit platform on poverty that they're prepared to cost out and put before Canadians to assess and make judgments upon because they owe that to us and we owe it to ourselves to make sure they don't get away with doing it again. I just wanted to, uh, to build on, on something you said, Hugh, which I, I think is very important. Uh, when, you, when you began uh, just now uh, speaking about the individuals who, who became... You were speaking about the individuals who, uh, who, who got involved in their, in their own situation, were able to, uh, to, to make a difference with that little bit of assistance and help to be able, able to do that. And it's one of the things that, that is very important to me is that uh, in, in community partnerships, which I think is, is so critical and so key to the future, one of the, of, as we use the term stakeholders, one of the individuals or groups that need to be part of this is the people who are affected by this. Because I agree 100% with you. I, I think folks want to take charge of their future. They want to look at the opportunities that are present before them. They want to make a difference in their communities. And then they want to give back. And I, and I believe that's true. And I think if we get together and begin to talk about this as a community, uh, the, the group of people that this affected needs to be part of that conversation. It's been a very powerful lesson I think we've learned from the results of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the calls to action. There are a number of those calls of action that relate specifically to what were called the, the church and the ecclesiastical entities within that. And one of those calls very particularly said, in terms of our relationships with First Nations community, and particularly how decisions are made and how governance happens. And so we talk a lot now in building for the future of that relationship, and we use the phrase, we want to walk with, to walk together with. It's critically important. Within our church, we're having a meeting this summer in, in Toronto, our general synod that meets every three years, and there's going to be a day devoted to discussing our relationships with First Nation communities within our diocese, and, and what's that going to look like moving forward in the future. Uh, within our church, we have a national indigenous bishop, uh, Mark McDonald, who travels extensively and who ministers to uh, First Nations communities within dioceses. He's responsible to our, our primate archbishop, Fred Hiltz. He does amazing work. He's also been elected as, a, as the North American Vice President for the World Council of Churches. So it gives you an indication of the gravitas that this man brings to the conversation. Uh, had a wonderful opportunity to, to speak with him, with our delegates who will be going to General Synod um, for a couple of hours and, and speaking about that day that will be spent and the hopes and dreams for that uh, outcome of walking together with. So I think it's very important that, uh, and you made that point of that kind of paternalistic approach to charity and to care, and, and, it's, and it's heartfelt. There's no doubt in my mind, the lady that you referenced uh, in Nova Scotia, that this is heartfelt with the very best of intentions. But I think, I think the 21st century is calling for a new path forward in building those partnerships. And I, I've seen the evidence of what can happen with that firsthand, and, and touching on some of the things that, that Hugh was referencing. When I ministered in Prince Edward Island, in the west end of Prince Edward Island, you, you might remember there was a national news story. Uh, this would be back in the mid-90s. There was a huge stir in one of the communities there, uh, Tignish, Prince Edward Island, where there was a McLean's article that came out and referred to it as Pogeville because the unemployment rate in Tignish was somewhere around 80 to 85%. Uh, everyone there were seasonal workers, and when the seasonal industries were suffering, everybody was suffering. 
Um, but there was a very strong sense of community cooperation, and they were so hurt by that term, that phraseology, because to know those people are to know people who walk together and who work together. When I was ministering there, one of the things that I noticed in my parish sort of took that whole top end of Prince Edward Island was the area that I ministered in. I found and when we're speaking about homelessness, and, and sometimes homelessness takes a form where people almost can be homeless living in their own home where they're wondering how, what, who's going to keep the roof over their head. When the plumbing goes, who's going to fix it? And when you're economically stressed, that becomes a huge stress each and every day of life. And I remember the visits that I made to a number of, of places there where people were struggling just to get by, elderly people who were struggling in their own homes. And I spoke to some of my colleagues in the other churches in the West End of PEI, and I said, I know what I'm experiencing, what are you experiencing? And they said, you know, it's exactly the same thing. We all had that. And when we started to pull together those numbers, we found that this was a huge stress. Uh, but people weren't speaking about it. You, you made that reference, uh, Steve Palkin, in that debate around referring to poverty. It's one of these things that's almost unspoken, uh, that, that, that is buried beneath the surface. And people would not speak about it. It was a huge pride issue related to this. And that's one of the things, again, when we speak about the values base from which we work, one of the primary values that I think should motivate all of us is respect for the dignity of every human being, without question. I, I, without question. I, I once had the privilege of hearing Henry Nouwen speak, and if you've ever heard of Henry Nouwen, Jean Vanier, the L'Arche community, um, it's one of those moments, do you ever have those moments in time where you're somewhere and you wish time would slow right down to a crawl? Well, I was listening to Henry Nouwen speak, and he said something that has, has always stuck with me. He said, when you meet somebody, and that's everyone you meet, you know two things about that individual right off the bat, without question. You know that that person was created by and passionately loved by God number one. And number two, that person is a gift to you today, without question. And I remember when he said it, I could immediately catalog all the gifts in my life. And then I started getting to the end of that Rolodex. <laughs> and there were other names. But he said, without question, these folk are all gifts. So that's that sense of the dignity of every human being. When we began to work in Prince Edward Island with that value-based principle, we came together to begin to say, how can we address this? And, and long story short, we began to work on, on constructing a facility in the town of Alberton that was a, a personal enriched residential care facility for seniors that was based on that principle of the dignity of the human being and the individual who would come in there that, that would, would bolster their, their, their sense of self, their sense of dignity and self-worth. Um, we, we began to build partnerships with the local MLA, uh, who was Hector McLeod, the local MP at that time, was a man named Joe McGuire. Uh, the, the municipality got involved, and this partnership began to grow and grow and grow and grow. And that facility sits there to this day. And what was kind of fascinating is maybe some of you are aware we're working on a, a project in partnership with Habitat for Humanity on a church property we have over on Cowdy Street, where we're looking at building a number of units of, of housing, uh, and then looking at uh, developing a center there where we can have programming come out of there for the benefit of the community. And uh, we did also a partnership with the Queen's School of Urban Planning, and a wonderful group of, of people uh, that, that got together and students and worked for two years on developing a project proposal for that Cowdy Street property. And I went to their presentation and they said, we want to, to show you a number of models we've discovered in our research that you might want to emulate. And I started flipping through them and then I came down to the W.J. Phillips residence in Alberton, Prince Edward Island. I said, I think I'm familiar with that one. Uh, you know, so it, again, uh, it's when people come together, when you pull together that energy and strength. I remember speaking to uh, uh, the, the provincial government representative at the time who was saying, you know, we can't put money into bricks and mortar anymore. And I said, you know, leave the bricks and mortar to us. We'll handle the bricks and mortars. We're, lo we're looking for the programming and the supports and the assistance to be able to do that. And what happened out of that was the fact that we were able to put a facility there in place for a fraction of the cost that it would have cost had it been uh, a government tendered project done solely that way in, in the usual tendering procedures put at a fraction of the cost, but the other things that happened were that the individuals who, who benefited from living there, the, the health care issues uh, descended dramatically, the stressors were gone, 
Uh, it, and not only the stress for the individuals who were there, but also for their immediate families who struggled around some of these particular issues. And so when we think of, if we think in, in terms of purely economic points of view, uh, and if that's all we do, it's a win-win-win all the way around because the, the savings, and I know Hugh has, has a lot of numbers on this that I have read, around the savings of investing in people. So building those partnerships, investing in people makes that huge difference. I just wanted to build on, on what you said, but thank you for that. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I want to go back to you, Hugh, and, and talk about something that I sometimes hear when we talk about poverty and homelessness. There's a kind of presumption that the poor don't do enough to help themselves. It's a kind of blame the poor. How do you respond to that? Well, I think it comes from that Victorian notion that if you're poor, it's because at some level you're morally flawed. Right? And when you hear people say, if you pay people to do nothing, they will do nothing, they're the people who don't know. that 70% of the people in this city who are beneath the poverty line have one job, some have two, they just don't earn enough to make what they need not to be above the poverty line. So the notion that it's about laziness and boxes of chocolates and couches and watching the soaps is an interesting, if I may say so, right-wing falsehood which is being used to slow down change and progress on this file, number one. Number two, let's talk about... Let <laughs> let's talk about cost some business people in the room who I love and, and, and embrace, let's look at the cost. If you accept that we're dealing with a grosso modo number of 10%, which means 3 million Canadians are living beneath the poverty line, different percentages in different areas, but generally speaking, 3 million Canadians. If you had to top them up to above the poverty line or close to the poverty line, you're looking at an initial investment of 30 billion dollars. It's a lot of money. It's less than 10% of the total federal budget as we sit here tonight. Less than 10%. Number one. Number two, why would a province want this to happen? Because if a province is paying, as we are in Ontario, something like nine billion dollars a year in welfare payments, everybody who's topped up guaranteed annual income through the federal income tax system will no longer be eligible for welfare. The province will have nine billion dollars to spend on other things. Early childhood education, spend on um, um, palliative care, spend on things which are underfunded in many circumstances because the province has said they have no choice. This would liberate those funds in a very constructive and significant way. And let's put that money in perspective. $30 billion, less than 10% of the federal budget, um, is an amount that would produce a return on investment in terms of reduced demand on the healthcare system, reduced demand on the penal system, more efficient economic participation, more people paying taxes, because you would be paying taxes once you got above a certain level, more people working, more people consuming, therefore more people paying GST. We would probably see a significant recoup over a period of time to balance things out quite responsibly. So the notion that we can't afford it is absolute doggerel being used to scare the pants off us, particularly in times of economic difficulty. And I would argue those are precisely the times to engage. R.B. Bennett didn't talk about introducing unemployment insurance and universal health care during a time of compelling economic well-being. He did it right in the middle of the Depression. And that's what Mr. Roosevelt did when he talked about the four freedoms. The two freedoms I care about the most are freedom from fear and freedom from want. And when you're poor and there's no hope, you're awash in fear because you're awash in want. Because you don't know how you're going to meet your responsibilities as a parent. You don't you know, the phenomena are clear. Teachers have told me about it. It's the kid who shows up, the lunchbox, nothing in it, because he forgot to get his lunch. He didn't forget to get his lunch. There was no lunch to get. 
Why did this city, why did the Harris government, if you can imagine, engage to do a universal breakfast program in this city and other cities with local community and other pulse? But because they knew that kids were arriving at school without breakfast. And the ability of a young person to start to learn, to acquire knowledge with insufficient nutrition in their body, only diminishes their chances going forward. This is not about an expense. It's about an investment. It is measurable. It is manageable. And it would be criminally irresponsible not to do it. Thank you. Yeah. One final completely unnecessary point. For those who say to me, they're going to game the system, these people who are going to be part of this. I said, well, that's good, because there's been no gaming of the system by anybody else. <laughs> 08, 09, Wall Street, billions lost, middle class taxpayers bailing them out, right? No gaming of the system there. But God forbid some low income person might, you know, get an extra job for 50 bucks a week and uh, not tell anybody. That's serious gaming of the system. That's the double standard which I don't think Canadians can accept or embrace or tolerate anymore. And I say that, and I, and I say that as a former progressive conservative. <laughs> In just uh, a few minutes, I want to go to questions from the audience, but I want to ask each one of you one final question, uh, a fairly brief answer, so that we do have time to hear from all these wonderful folks who have joined us tonight. Do you, each of you, I'll start with you, Michael, and then go to Hugh, do you really believe, really believe, that poverty can be eradicated? The short answer would be yes. I, I think if there's community will, if there's political will, if there's a will to come together, if there's a will to believe that there's no problem that is insoluble, uh, when, when, when good people with good hearts put their, put, their, put their backs into it and work hard, when we're willing to work together with, with all stakeholders within society and come together, there's absolutely no reason why any problem is, and, I, and that relates, we're, we're speaking about poverty and homelessness tonight is, is the focus. I believe that's true with all of the seemingly insoluble problems of the world, uh, from the local to the global stage. None of these problems are insoluble if we have the courage and the will and the dedication to come together to put aside the things that divide, that we can, we can argue about hydro rates another day. We can argue about the electoral system another day. But, we, but these sorts of problems require combined community will. And if we tackle that, uh, everything's achievable. How about you, Hugh? I think by uh, 2020, which is about four years or so from now, we will have an operative basic income floor in Ontario, and I believe it'll begin to spread like wildfire across the country because fiscally, economically, socially, and small p politically, it's just the right thing to do, and it's the best way to use our resources in support of a strong economic and social framework for our way ahead. Thank you very much. But there's a large population, it's about three, three to five percent of the population who has a serious mental illness. And they are the people that are becoming homeless. They're not only homeless, they go to the prison because they don't have any health care. And you can't prevent their need for health care because they have a condition. But they end up doing that cycle and that it's not getting any better, it's in fact getting a lot worse. And I think that that has to be put into the equation. I think what I'm asking you to do is to parse the problems. Clearly there are poor people with unfortunate circumstances, there are people who are sick, who have terrible circumstances which they can't, won't be able to get out of unless they're stabilised. And I think this, this has to be a concern for this city, given that we have prisons and we have hospitals, we have to address this problem for what it is, and that is there's too little health care of a, of a high caliber for these individuals. And it could be you, it could be me, if we were unfortunate enough to slip through. And I think that we've just got to address that problem from here on in, because it's not going to get any better. 
I think I did. Would, you, would you like either of these two? Yes, I'd like both of them too, please, because I'm quite sure the Senate has discussed this, and I think that okay. the Okay, so why don't, why don't we ask you to respond, and then uh, Michael. Um, thank you for raising the issue of mental health. I think we've had two challenges on mental health. The first one is a stigma which existed for far too long in large parts of our society, which made it difficult for people to come forward and made the society we live in uncomfortable about dealing with mental health. The work of the um, uh, Kirby Committee, the Senate, that uh, produced the Mental Health Commission of Canada aimed specifically at dealing with that issue of stigma and funding research is one very small step, which doesn't engage at the pragmatic level of day-to-day -day lives, but does engage at the macro level of making sure we treat mental illness on an equal basis with other illnesses and make no judgment about the nature of the illness before we make sure there's treatment, number one. Number two, I think a guaranteed annual income, if I may say so with respect, is not about something special for the mentally ill. It's for people who happen to be poor for whatever reason. Separating out one group of poor people from another group of poor people and saying some support is necessary but no support is necessary here is wrong. Is there special support necessary in terms of treatment, community service, and engagement for the mentally ill? Absolutely. But that should not be used, I say this with respect, as an excuse for not moving ahead on the broader project. Thank you, Hugh. May I respond, please? Okay, and then we, uh, there are a number of people behind yes. you, so do respond. But and first then we'll... of all, I think you have to grasp that people that are mentally ill frequently don't, can't ask for help. It's nothing to do with stigma. They can't ask for help. They're, in the, they're trapped. So that would be the response I have. The Kirby Commission, commission by the way, I challenged many times because they got a lot of things wrong. Okay. All right, thank you very Seriously much. Seriously wrong. Okay. Right. Thanks. Did you want to respond to? Just very quickly, uh, one, one of the, I think you raise a very important point. And, and uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking that uh, for far too long now, we have used the criminal code as a tool for social reform and health care. And that's never what it was intended to be for. And I think we need to take a, a, seriously look, a serious look at how we're addressing those particular um, uh, situations and the individuals that are affected by that. I know there's, a, there's reform happening within the, the healthcare system and particularly related to mental health. There's things that I think are positive about it. There are things that cause me a bit of concern. And one is a, a push to sort of do more care delivery in the community, which I think is, is positive as long as the supports are in place because I think one of the difficulties that people face as, as the person that you identified uh, at the beginning of your, of your remarks is that they have very little community support, family or friends who will come around and support that the system can, can, can bolster that support. So as long as the supports are in place, because I think it's a good to have community-based health care, but those are the two thoughts that I have uh, right off the top of my head. May I just respond? Because I, having, having been, having ma been, ma uh, ma I'm please. sorry, no, I'd please. like to say that, that, that they do have families. The families are absolutely without power to do anything about it. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now, yes, the next gentleman, please. Uh, Lionel Enright, Belleville, Ontario. Came all the way down here to see you and uh, his friend, although I didn't know his friend. Uh, I wanted to make reference to the elephant in the room that uh, we haven't brought up that is really the root cause of all of this. You made reference to it, Hugh, in the billions of dollars that were stolen on Wall Street. However, that only uh, leads to the fact that there are trillions of dollars continuously stolen from the public purse all over the world, and the mechanisms are in place. It was announced in uh, November 2014 by Oxfam that within a year and a half, 50% of the wealth in the world would reside in 1% of the hands. I just happened to be watching the scroll on the screen in, I think it was November or December in 2015. Credit Suisse said we'd already accomplished the task. The point is that if you can manage to engineer 50% of the wealth into 1% of the hands, we can guarantee that it's not being done 
fairly, honestly, and democratically. I would make one last reference. Gandhi said, or at least it was attributed to him, there's enough for everyone's need, but not everyone's greed. My question is, when are we going to actually talk about the dishonest mechanisms that are in place, that are being accepted, that are not being challenged, which cause all of our problems? We could have all kinds of money for health care, infrastructure, and eradicate poverty if this were so. Thank you. Well, um, you have touched upon a very important larger debate about how we organize the tax system, generally speaking, how we enforce the tax system, generally speaking, what kind of tax rates we have, and whether or not a complex tax system which can be managed more easily by wealthy people is better than a simple tax system where everybody pays the same kind of percentage for the same level of income. We have in this country, to its credit, a progressive tax system. If you earn more, you pay more. On the other hand, we have a system which says the legal avoidance of tax, not evasion, but avoidance of tax through what's called tax planning is an accepted part of the system. Clearly, the Panama Papers that are now part of the public domain, clearly the Credit Suisse lists that were leaked, and the agreements of governments to begin to move on the issue of, um, of uh, tax havens reflects, not at an appropriate pace, the concerns just expressed by our colleague at the microphone about a greater sense of equity. The challenge will be this. How do you achieve that greater real equality of opportunity? I'm not a great one for equality of outcome. I leave that to our socialist friends. I love them and I respect them, but I don't think you can legislate equality of outcome. But I think you can legislate equality of opportunity so that people get the same shot at a good education, people get access to health care, people are treated fairly by the tax system with no special deals for those who may be upper, uh, upper end in terms of the range. That is a project that is very much still before us. I'm hopeful that the new dynamic in the House of Commons, the new government that is now there, will produce a broader understanding of those issues and that the pressure will build I don't know what will happen in the United States. I've stopped predicting anything about the United States in the last little while, but I think in Europe and in Great Britain, this debate is very much engaged. And while we can be a little bit hopeful that the gaps in this country aren't quite as bad as they are in some other parts of the world, any gap that has 5% of the population at one level and everybody else way down and insufficient resources to deal with our legitimate public investment requirements is a gap that should be intolerable for all of us. And the real question is something like this. Are we prepared to invest public funds in the kind of society which will be more profitable, humane, and socially progressive than the one we now have? That's the big debate in Canadian politics. I'm on the side of those who want to invest and want to have fair taxation policies to find the money necessary to make those investments. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Next question. Yes, good evening. I think I'm the only Southeast Asian in this room. And if you talk about poverty, there is absolute and relative poverty. And I have experienced them all. Without a vision, as King Solomon says, the people will perish. What you can see right now in this room, there are no 20-year-olds. Maybe there are. But these are the future, the resource of the system to sustain the livelihood of the boomers. I don't see any younger people here who are 20 year old. You got one. You're the one percent. However, what I'm gonna uh, what I'm gonna talk about is education. 
my vision is that a teacher should teach and make the kids aware what poverty is all about. An example is Atawa Pescat. Kids go suicide because they don't have a vision. I am not motivated to do something if I don't have a goal. There is a disconnect right now in the Canadian population about education. We have an abundance of educators, teachers. The word that I like is transfer, transform. All the information that you teachers have so that you will not feel the poverty of a third world like the Philippines. We don't have the luxury of a roof. We have holes in our roof. The ceilings are not that sturdy or strong. The walls, a bullet could go through and you don't know if you're dead or alive. What I'm saying is I don't want you and your children to experience what I have experienced. You have an abundance, abundant knowledge. The strategies that I've heard today is amazing. But who are the population that you have to nurture? For me, the 10-year-olds. And who are the direct contacts of the 10-year-olds? The teachers. What do they see? They mimic the behavior of the teachers, the people, the adults. It's up to you guys. There is an abundance of knowledge and strategies, but how can you execute? That is the question. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Michael, do you want to respond? Thank you. I, I think a couple of things that, that I, I want to draw out of what you were saying and, and your comment around, around the room. I, when I was speaking earlier about that, that untapped resource of, of the young people that are, my, my experience and, and everything that I have been told said that these young people are people, that they, they're not big into coming into evenings like this and having a conversation. They want to roll up their sleeves and get to work. And, and, I, and they're, they're just waiting for uh, someone to come along to motivate them, to bring them together, and, and, and to, to tackle things. And that, that's, that's my experience with, with that demographic. Um, tons of energy there. I, 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 think, I think it's important that... Uh, the, the other thing that I was thinking is you were describing the Philippines and, and the situation there. And we look at... We do live in, in a blessed part of the world. There's, there's no doubt of that. I always remember a lady from Sarajevo who spoke once a number of years ago uh, in the height of the troubles in the former Yugoslavia. And she said, you know, in Canada, she said, you have such beautiful cities and it's such a wonderful, peaceful place. My city of Sarajevo used to be like that. We all were together. We, we, the differences weren't, weren't pronounced. It wasn't difficult. And sometimes I think that, that the security that we have in our country uh, is, can be gossamer thin. And we always have to be thankful for it, and we have always have to work hard to protect it. My point is that I think we have a lot of allies in that work uh, ahead of us if we can motivate them, bring them together, and then tackle tackle all of the problems that, that are faced. I think I think too to say that that it's not a a, a one-off, you know, dealing with one particular issue at a time. I think we need to bring everything together and kind of look at at our total social picture and what we want to see, what are the values that motivate us within our community, what kind of society do we want to have. We've had quite a conversation, I think, going back to our last federal election, around, around who we are as Canadians. What is our identity? That was a real identity question, uh, I, I think, that came out of that. And, and I think we're, we have an opportunity to work with that. Thank you very much, Michael. We have a... wonder if you could uh, offer the microphone to the gentleman in the wheelchair. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lot I could say on this, but I'll try to keep it short for you. Um, one thing that I see is that, you know, there's an old saying, you know, 
when your cup is full, stop pouring. When is enough going to be enough? You know, haven't we got enough problems here to solve without us bringing more problems into Canada? Talking about your immigration. You know, I remember we just had a talk on the way in, you know, of Adam and Eve. You know, when Adam and Eve, or Adam took the bite of the apple, or Eve did, I don't remember how it fully went, but, you know, why did we pay for the sins of Adam and Eve? Well, I think of that myself, okay? Why am I paying the sins of poverty? I'm not a drug addict. I'm not an alcoholic. As you think, so shall you be. You know, I, I grew up in a hard life where um, I was labeled developmentally delayed, put in places that I shouldn't have been. And I always believed that I was never that way, and people still look at me as disabled. I call myself a wheeler. I'm, I'm just a man that uses wheels for legs. It doesn't mean nothing. You know, as you think, so shall you be. The mind is chief. Everything is mind made. You know, like I said, there's a lot that I could say. I have a plan of my own. I hope to get into politics myself one day because I would like to see poverty and the Canadian debt abolished. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, I won't plug my book, but one of the points I make in it is that when you look around the world, there is a common reality. The countries that are the most poor are the most violent. And the countries that are the most violent are the most poor. Poverty begets a lack of respect for authority, and it's understandable. And violence is a way of ensuring that you can't make progress on economic issues. And I've made the case that Canada's foreign policy, regardless of which party's in power, shouldn't be about left or right or center or this nuance or that. It should be underlying values that every human being in this country, anywhere in the world, deserves freedom from fear and freedom from want. Because with those two freedoms, a person can live their life. A parent can have hope for his or her children you know you can send your kids to school and there's a fighting chance they're gonna come home safe and sound. If you live in a society where you can make economic progress, and I'm not someone who is against the profit motive, I'm a great believer in investment and responsible business activity, but if you think the system is so corrupt in any particular country where you don't have a chance making economic progress, and when someone says to you, you know you have nothing to lose, why not come with our terrorist group because we're going to get noticed? I've often said to my friends on both sides of the Palestinian and Israeli argument, if the income of Palestinians in Gaza was greater than 14% of the average Israeli income across the border, you could have a much more civilized discussion about looking for a common solution. So rather than look at the security issue, ask ourselves as Canadians, what can we do with others to invest in economic growth, social opportunity, and schools and all the rest on the Gaza side, so those families have a reason to look for peace and to look for some kind of agreement with their neighbors. That is the same issue we have to face in this country, just so we're not complacent, with our First Nations brothers and sisters. The TRC could not have been more clear and precise about that. It is about respect. It is about constitutional rights. It is about history. Siegel's first principle of public life. When they say it's not the money, it's the principle, trust me, it's the money. <laughs> And I actually believe the point made before um, and the point made by the gentleman who talked about education and young people and the Philippines is about those two freedoms. And if we had a domestic policy that was judged by what has government aid done? What has that budget done to diminish 
people's fear and want and increase their sense of freedom and opportunity. And we applied the same standards to our foreign policy around the world. We'd have a much better criterion by which to assess priorities, investments, and make a real difference in people's lives. And I want to thank the two previous questioners for helping us get to that point. Thank you, Hugh. We'll take one final question, and then we'll wrap up. I was going to say... Could, could you move the microphone a little closer, because we're having trouble hearing you. The gentleman before me said that the cup was full. Yes, it is. I think we can share it with many. And we have the ability to do something about what is going on in our cities. One of the things I really would like to see happen is I would love to see more shelters at night for the street people. I know several of the street people personally and try and help them as much as I can. And they go to the library so they can sleep during the day. Because at night, if they sleep, someone will either sexually attack them or rob them of anything that they do have, which is precious little. And they'll wake up with no shoes in the morning. This just should not be going on. There should be places where they can go in the daytime to sleep. And they should have food. And I hate seeing people beg on every street corner. It's time that we really did something about this. We are a great country. We are a strong country. But we're only as great as our poorest person. And I feel ashamed for how these people have been treated. When I was a young girl, I asked my father to change something, and he did that for me. The schools were strapping children, and I told my dad, they don't strap convicts. Why are they strapping children? So when he went and got a place on the school board, he had that changed for me. But he gave me a job. He said, I want you now to look after your fellow man. And that's what I'm trying to do. And everybody here should be doing something. Thank you so much. You want? I said one more question, but we'll have one one more question. Well, my brain's a little fatigued, so I hope I can get this out properly. Uh, got touched on slightly, but this, this economic business of how big a house has to be built for a family, and it seems so many of them are outsized for the number of people living in the house, which is a big pressure on the parents, just for example. And I think it is totally horrific that uh, if you want to pay a mortgage, you have to partner up with either some relatives or friends so you can afford to get one house. And why, uh, and I, I don't know, I, and, and the municipal laws of about being allowing um, to be able to rent out in your house, they, they did modify that a few years ago just because it would help on the, on the pressure on how much uh, housing was available. But, but I think that these kind of things are, you know, people are pressured into poverty. I mean, and it, you're, I'm sure you're all aware of the costs of houses and they're not necessarily all that big a mansion, so to speak. So <laughs> I, think, I think that's basically, it was slightly touched on, but I just wanted to highlight it a little bit. I think it's certainly one part of the, as you, you said, a complicated question. Right. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, our host and chairman for tonight, uh, Peter Gower, to come and wrap up. And Peter, I hope you remind people that they can make a contribution to Lunch by George.
I'd forgotten all about that. That's very good. Uh, gentlemen, I, I believe that you've probably been speaking to the converted. Um, I know that you've entertained them. I hope that you've lit a fire beneath them so that they realize that personally they can do more. And I expect that many will want to stay and, and ask more questions or visit the community tables around the, uh, uh, the edge or have refreshments or, or make donations. Thank you. And I invite you group to thank you, gentlemen, for your time and for your insight tonight. Thank you very, very much.